Theater of the Mind. Well, the big night has come and gone. Halloween 2019 is now just a memory, hopefully a fond memory, and by now I'm sure most haunters have had their fair share of post-mortems and debriefings about the construction, decoration, and performance. This year was a no-go for me. I was sick earlier that week, and I knew I just didn't have the energy reserves to be a haunt actor. I could have done it, but it would have taken so much out of me I wouldn't have been able to go to work the next day, and I'd already missed a day and a half. So I had to content myself with just going to the haunt and going through as an audience member, and having a few beers and some of the traditional annual haunt chili with the team. They got a late start building this year. I don't even think they'd come up with a theme until almost September, which is rare for that family. They did a zombie apocalypse theme. It was an outbreak of a zombie virus at a CDC facility. And for a rush project, I must say they did a pretty good job. They had a very small crew, so there wasn't much of a zombie horde there. I think there were maybe three total. But they made the most of what they had, and it looked really good. I was surprised at the crowd. We were expecting a weak turnout because it was insanely cold that night. Very uncharacteristic for St. Louis at that time of the year. But they showed up in their coats and waited in line with smiles on their faces. Hopefully the family already have the theme for next year and will be going to town with the planning because next year is the final show and it's going to be a blowout. Granted, they've said that they were quitting a number of times before and they always came back the next year. Kind of reminds me of a certain Halloween and haunting podcast I know. But this time, I think it's for real. The husband of the team has MS and he just doesn't have the strength and stamina to do the build anymore. It's sad, but they've had a lot of fun for many years with it, and they've made some new friends, me being one of them, and they've built a lot of fond memories to share. I'm definitely going to go back to playing a more active role in the build, though. I want them to go out with a bang next year. I just hope the weather cooperates. Though I have to admit, my favorite year haunting with them was absolutely rain-soaked. In 2009, it rained almost continually for something like 27 days out of 31 that October. The ground was a bog. We were constantly throwing fresh straw on the grassy areas where people walked because they'd become mud slicks. The build was constantly delayed. On the paved surfaces where we had the stuff set up, there were puddles everywhere. Fortunately, this was before the municipality laid down the law about putting a roof overhead. Now we have to set up under open sky and we can't use the garage anymore, but at that time, we were at least able to keep the rain off of us while we painted. The wood on the vortex tunnel had swelled from the moisture. It seized up and wouldn't turn. It looked like it was going to be a disaster, but we valiantly labored on because the show must go on. Miraculously, the weather finally broke the morning of Halloween and the sun came up for the first time in what felt like months. I and several others got there bright and early to join up with the family and we hauled ass all day, setting up props, running cables and extension cords, setting up lights and speakers, stapling up tarps. The work was frantic and nonstop. The guy they got the vortex tunnel from showed up and got it running again, for which there was much rejoicing. Nerves were starting to fray. People were getting a little crazy and we had to delay opening for about two and a half hours, but by God, we did it. We busted ass and got it done because... I repeat, the show must go on. I use that phrase deliberately because I thought it appropriate. The saying, the show must go on, originated in the circus, and this was our circus haunt. Well, carnival, actually. They used to have an underlying theme in all their haunts. They were always set in the fictitious town of Blackford, and every year would be a certain place or event in that town. This year was, the carnival comes to Blackford, and it was mostly a clown haunt. I know the theme is done to death, but when a circus-themed haunt avoids just repeating one or two threadbare cliches and really puts some thought and variety into the show, it can be wildly entertaining for the guests. And let me tell you, if you do it right and really throw yourself into character, a clown haunt is the most fun you can have with your pants still on. I worked at a real circus one season. Circus Flora, it's based in St. Louis, but performs all over the country. It's not a glitzy arena type show, but a real traveling one ring tent circus under a big top. It's sort of a hybrid of American and old European circus styles, and their cast is rich with what has to be considered the royalty of both circus worlds. It's a very cool and interesting dynamic working with circus folk. They're fun people, and the stories you hear hanging out with them are fantastic. There's a lot of pride and passion there, and they're serious about putting smiles on the faces of the crowd. The circus is a place of fun, awe, wonder, and joy, but it is definitely ripe for hunting. 
The weirdness and color and mystery of it all just begs for darkening and distorting into something nightmarish and disturbing. It's like the haunt and Halloween fascination with evil, creepy children or dolls. Something about the corruption of innocence, taking something everybody thinks of as happy and nice, but twisting it into something sinister and horrifying. Everything in a circus is painted, and it can be difficult to tell what's real and what's not. Many of the performances are incredibly dangerous. Death truly lurks waiting in the shadows. Giovanni Zope, who played Nino the Clown at Circus Flora, had barely survived a near-fatal fall during an aerial act about 15 years before I worked with him, and I damn near saw it happen again on a high-wire act during our run. Most of the audience thought it was part of the act, but the other guys in the ring crew and I knew what was going on, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Oftentimes, dangerous animals are present who can viciously attack or even kill their handlers, or cause utter catastrophe if they turn on the crowd. Circuses in the old days also had sideshows and freak shows, thankfully frowned upon in modern times, featuring deformed people, sometimes performing hideous or disgusting acts for the amazement or horror of the audience. And of course, if it's a circus, you know there's gonna be clowns. Coolrophobia is an irrational fear of clowns, and it's not uncommon. People who display some degree of coolerphobia are basically walking in preloaded from a scare perspective. You won't have to do much to get them screaming. Some people aren't coolerphobes, but they do find haunt clowns very disturbing. Probably something to do with that corruption of innocence thing mentioned earlier. Older Americans will remember John Wayne Gacy, one of the worst serial killers in American history, who performed for charities as Pogo or Patches the Clown. That's where the phrase killer clown first came from. And, of course, there's the book, miniseries, and movies of Stephen King's It to get people primed up. Clowns are just kind of wrong. The slapstick comedy found in American-style clowns is actually often kind of violent and even sometimes portrays death, albeit in cartoonish ways. They're painted so you don't really know what they actually look like with distorted, unnatural features. A lot of thought went into the makeup I chose for Disturbo, my clown character for The Haunt. I made a bald cap to cover my hair, and it looked like a bald cap, not a real bald head, but under the grease paint it was covered with realistic scabs and open sores. I had punched in some neon green hair, but in a very sparse, random way that kind of looked like the hair of a chemotherapy or radiation patient before it's completely fallen out. Liquid tooth makeup made for hideously decayed teeth, and I walked with a bow-legged, rocking gait that you often see in people with tertiary syphilis. Add a demeanor that veered wildly between lascivious lewdness, crazed hysterical laughter, and a vicious rage, I had created a nasty, unsavory character that I felt was more in tune with the circus's grimier, seedier brother, the carnival. The carnival has a much more mixed reputation than the circus, and for a lot of good reasons. The traveling carnival crew has a reputation of being much like the French Foreign Legion. When you join, you no longer have a past. No one really wants to know. You're part of that family now. Your previous life is irrelevant. For that reason, these traveling roadshows have historically been sought out by people on the run or trying to disappear. And if someone is useful to the group and needs to hide, the other carnies will hide them. Carnies are not like circus folk. They have the same group loyalty and they're very protective of each other, but with a very us and them mentality concerning the people who attend the show. That pride, honor of tradition, and love for the audience that personifies circus folk just isn't a part of the average carny's makeup. A carnival isn't tradition-based, it's money-based. At a circus, aside from the souvenirs and concessions, one ticket gets you the whole show. Everything at a carnival costs individually. Every ride, every game, every attraction, you fork out more tickets. People attending the circus are the crowd. The people attending a carnival are marks. You have money, and they want to get it, and they'll do whatever it takes to get more of it. The games are almost always rigged. They give out just enough prizes to give you hope so you keep spending more to play. Also, while it's not as common today, carnies of old traditionally spoke in cant, a sort of code language to conceal the meaning of their discussions from those outside the group. For a great look at the seedy side of the carnival world, check out the 1980 movie Carney with Jodie Foster and Gary Busey. It's a good one. You'll feel like you need a bath afterwards, but you'll like it. If you want to do a carny haunt and you have the money, time, and space, you can do it up very realistically. Have some games, with the appropriate Halloween flair, of course. Maybe people would try to shoot baskets with skulls or severed heads, or try to toss eyeballs into cups. 
You probably can't actually sell concessions without a license, but you can rent a popcorn cart and give popcorn away. It's fairly cheap. Real rides are probably a no-go for cost, space, and safety reasons, but you can make some mock ones that little creatures or skellies would ride. If you're doing an actual circus haunt, you really can't do it as realistically. Unless you actually are an acrobat, there's not a lot of actual circus-level performance to be done, but you or people you know might have some circus skills. Granted, there won't be any trapeze or high wire acts, but if someone knows how to juggle, ride a unicycle, or crack a whip, that little bit of flair will add a lot of authenticity to your show. And of course, it's doubtful anybody has any tigers or elephants that they can lend you, but showing scenes of the aftermath of a lion attack would look good, especially if it's just outside an empty cage with the door open, suggesting that the lion is roaming loose in the haunt. Maybe a little later, the guest might trigger a loud roar from a loudspeaker right behind them. Same could be done with the more dangerous circus acts. You could set up several scenes of performers killed by failed performances. Maybe the sword swallower is lying on the ground with the sword poking out the back of his neck, or the knife thrower's lovely assistant attached to the spinning wheel where none of the knives managed to miss her. I can picture several rooms lined up with scenes like these and a help wanted sign taped up at each scene. I don't care who you are, that's funny. And of course, there's a sideshow or freak show where your only limit is your imagination. Monstrosities, Siamese twins, half-human, half-animals, a geek biting the heads off rats, or better yet, bats. Play some Ozzy in the background. The kids won't get it, but the older guests will get a kick out of it. The famous P.T. Barnum never said there's a sucker born every minute. That's just a myth. But he did say, clowns are the pegs on which the circus is hung. They're a critical, important part of a circus, but they're not the whole show. Circuses are more than just clowns. There's a bounty of wild, weird, wonderful material that's good for any kind of haunt. It can be mysterious, cute and kid-friendly, grisly, funny, nightmarish. Pick your flavor. Go to some real circuses and traveling carnivals and pay attention. Think of all the elements that are within your reach or can be tweaked into a form that is within your reach. Watch some circus movies. Look up images from circuses and carnivals throughout the ages from all over the world, especially the old ones. Those old black and whites are awesome inspiration. Be sure to check out shows from all over the world, not just your home country, and look at the differences and similarities. And above all, have fun with it. Circuses and carnivals are fun, and so are the haunts they inspire. Just remember, the show must go on. Everything has to be painted, and always, always remember to leave the ghost light burning. From the Theater of the Mind, I'm Revenant, and you're listening to Oncast. I'm going now. Heaven help you. Please like and follow the podcast. Stalk us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Links in the description. And help us by sharing Hauntcast with all your haunted Halloween brethren. Until next time, stay scary.